Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go-to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Stefan Zavalin about the impacts of company culture and environment on employee health and well-being. Stefan Zavalin, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you. I am excited to be here. Yeah, it is a pleasure to be with you. I'm super excited to have this conversation. We're going to be focusing today on the impacts of company culture and environment on employee health. And, and really, we're going to be talking about employee health and wellness generally, but specifically those, those cultural and environmental components and how that may contribute or detract from the health and the well-being of our people in our organizations. As we get started, I wanted to share Stefan's bio with everybody. Dr. Stefan Zavalin is a doctor of physical therapy with a passion for movement and health. After a few years working in the physical therapy world, he started a consulting business, Love to Move, to help office workers reduce sitting time. The vision changed the American work culture to help bring more movement to the everyday life of office workers to maintain their health, wellness, and ultimately the longevity of their lives. In his free time, he likes to write songs on piano and guitar, uh, critique a good cup of coffee, and play board games with his wife and friends. I love all of that. That's wonderful. Uh, I am an uh, amateur musician myself. I love singing guitar, drums. I'm not very good at any of those things, but I enjoy them. You know, it's just such a pleasure to be with you. Anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of your background or personal context before we dive on into the conversation? Uh, The only big thing is that a lot of all those wonderful things, I uh, just published a book coming up for my 30th birthday, which is Monday. Uh, The book is called Sit Less, Evolve Your Work and Life uh, Without Compromising Your Health. That's the biggest other change. But yeah, all else was wonderful. Wonderful. And uh, happy almost birthday. That's that's awesome. Mine is in just a few weeks myself. So I'm gearing up and, and, you know, trying to think about how am I going to spend my day, but I'm a tad older than you. So, (laughs) Um, well, this is great. And I I couldn't help but, but think as as I was reading through your bio and as we were having a conversation and preparing for this episode, you know, I'm thinking about my life and my, my average work day uh, and what it looks like in terms of uh, how much movement I have. And I have to admit, like sometimes I, I, I try to be conscious of it. And sometimes I find myself uh, doing much better. But then there are other days where I find myself before I know it, eight, nine, 10 hours have gone by and I've been sitting behind my computer all stinking day long. <laughs> and, and it comes back to bite me big time, you know, in terms of soreness and, and headaches and, and all those sorts of things. When I'm really mindful of it and I can break up my day and I can break up my meetings uh, you know, take my dogs on walks and move around. And I even in my, my, uh, my home office, I don't have this, but in my, uh, my office at work, I have like a mini elliptical and a standing desk so I can actually be moving while I'm in meetings and stuff. So those, those types of things help, but it only works if I'm mindful enough to like do it. And, and I don't allow myself to get sucked in to just the grind and end up sitting all day. Absolutely. And you made so many great points. I'm glad that we have this in-person case study now that we can discuss and how we can improve your life in this, in this way as well. So yes, that internal motivation is so tough. And it's a huge reason why people have a difficult time exercising. We're here at the beginning of the year and many people have the New Year's resolution of I'm going to get fit this year and it's going to happen. The issue there is that you have actually already many things in your environment, if we were to say, as the standing desk, the elliptical, in a certain part of your environment, where yes, it's accessible to you. In another version of your office, you don't. You're going to be sitting down. And so that's that's the piece that inevitably helps, is if we set up our general environment where movement is more accessible. 
And that's the difference. One of the reasons that I call the book sit less is because I think the advice we always get is go exercise more, go move more, go for a walk, go do this. Those are great things. I'm not going to harp on exercise. I'm a physical therapist. I get it. Exercise is wonderful. But I think that we are going to burn out if we take that to scale. Because right now, like you said, 10 hours, the average is 12 to 13 hours a day for desk workers of sitting, which if you put in how much we're usually sleeping, we're, we're only moving around for a few hours throughout the day. And that's not enough. And the, the, the big number that I, that I use is that they found that 11 or more hours a day increases our risk of premature death by 40%. That's not the scary part. The unfortunate part is that risk is not reduced with exercise. So sure, you can take an hour and go walk. You can do you know, strength training, whatever it may be, but it's really about reducing the sitting. It's not about necessarily moving more. And that comes into what work tasks can you do that don't require you to sit quite as much? So video calls are a perfect example of that, of can we find ways to stand while we do them? Um, and that way you use the perfect word of break up your sitting. That's the key is can we break up intervals of sitting? Not necessarily have to walk around and stand the whole day, but reduce how much we're sitting for those periods of time. The inevitable question is, what's the ideal number? How long should I sit? 20 to 30 minutes, if you can do that, that's the ideal. You should, really shouldn't sit more than that. I'm very realistic. Start with an hour. Start trying to get up every hour <laughs> or doing something else, maybe every two hours. If you're the type that sits for four hours straight, okay, every two hours, find a task. So instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to go for a walk. Is there a phone call you can make standing up? Is there an email that you go, okay, I'm going to do this email or this specific spreadsheet standing up, whatever it may be. The more you do that, the more natural it becomes. So you also said getting into kind of a rut and then getting into the flow of things when it's really chaotic. When we make these a constant habit of say, I, I personally hate doing phone calls sitting down. Um, I always walk around and pace around the house when I have my uh, phone on. So that for me is just natural. So anytime I get a phone call, I'm up and moving. And even if it's a chaotic day, I still got some movement in. And I can always tell, by the way, same for video calls, if I've had a lot of calls or few calls by how my back feels. So you said sore and feeling that. If my back feels great, it means I had a lot of phone calls and video calls because I stood up and walked around for the majority of the day because that's just ingrained and built into that portion. So that's the environment. That's what we can personally do. But something else that you asked about is, well, what about the cultural side of things? That's the big part. And it's really what can leaders do to help their teams achieve this? Because internal motivation can only get you so far. It's the reason that most of us don't hit our New Year's resolutions is because we're all relying on internal parts. So creating a culture or really more so cultivating a culture of movement and accepting movement in our teams and in our workplaces, that is the key. And that's the big vision for what I am trying to do in general and help people do. And that can be as small as, hey, we're gonna stand up for the first five minutes of this meeting. Maybe there are certain meetings or certain one-on-ones that you can agree with, with various employees of, these are standing only meetings. We're gonna be on here for 20, 30 minutes. Let's both stand for this. As that spreads, that leadership of, oh, you know, like David stands up. I, why, I want to do that too. That sounds like a fun thing. Why aren't we all doing that? That builds in that culture. And I think meetings, especially with remote now, it's, it's a lot easier, of course, when you're in person to have everybody stand up with remote. It gets more challenging to impact culture, understandably. But movement is a great way to do it. Because if at the beginning of a meeting, you play a little game that involves movement or you put it at the end, great. Not only are you getting people more productive, more focused and engaged, you're also getting them healthier and the meeting is going to go that much better. Yeah. And I think in this, you know, COVID era, virtual meetings, you know, people getting sucked into hours and hours of Zoom meetings on end, you know, in this kind of an environment, you know, I also, I also often hear people uh, bemoan how many individuals on their team have their camera off during the meeting. And while to, to a certain extent, I understand that and you want engagement and you want involvement and whatnot. I have to admit, when I think about when I'm in those meetings, if my camera's on, I feel like I have to be like sitting in like presentable and in front of my camera and everything has to look good. But if I turn my camera off, 
I can be moving around doing anything, right? I can go walk my dogs. I can go fold laundry. I can go, you know, just move around, whatever. It doesn't matter. I'm still listening. I'm still paying attention. I'm still chiming in. I'm still sharing my thoughts. But because I don't have my camera on, it, it frees me up for movement. And so I wonder just how, as we're thinking about creating that environment and that culture, how much of that um, we need to be just very proactive about in this kind of virtual Zoom world um, so that people don't feel like they just have to be stuck behind their, their monitor and that little camera to, to put on a good face for the team. And that's it's a it's a brilliant point because it, it really puts in so much of even in person we uh, when somebody gives a presentation and we're sitting in a meeting room everybody's sitting they're stuck they're not supposed to be moving don't fidget you pay attention to me even though for many of us that may be not the way that we like to pay attention maybe you pay the best attention when you're walking your dog and you're going I'm really engaged right now with exactly what they're saying and so that's part of that is knowing your team. If your team needs and they're just going to completely goof off and not listen and they need the responsibility of I'm on camera, I need this. Great. You can have that discussion with them versus if they go, I feel uncomfortable standing up because I think that, you know, if I if I, I can't readjust my desk, people are going to see my belly button when I stand up, whatever it may be. Understandable. That's fine. Turn off the camera because I think we we discredit employees so much and we say, oh, they're just going to not pay attention and go away and do something else. But that tells me that you don't really trust your employees if that's what you're thinking they're going to do. Put that trust into them and also hear back what they have to say. If they say, hey, I really want this, but I just don't want to be on camera for it. All right, then maybe you do turn off cameras, but it's this understanding. And if there are people that are taking advantage of it, are, were they really going to be the ones that are going to be paying that close of attention uh, when they're on camera anyway? And maybe that's something to question as well. Why are they not engaged with that? Are the meetings too long? I, I can't tell you how many meetings I go, why was that an hour? Why was that 90 minutes? We could have, the ones I hate are the ones you can sum up in an email. And I go, I wasn't even, I didn't yeah. need to be there. Why? And so we're getting Zoom burnout, like you said, from so many people being on it. Check those meetings. The one, the beautiful thing about standing up for meetings, by the way, is that it makes meetings shorter because after a while people yeah. go, ah, I might need to sit down. Okay. Not only does it make people productive in the sense of, it gets the blood flowing, but also people go, okay, let's, let's keep, keep going. And they pardon the pun, think on their feet. For the most part, there are exceptions to this. And I have colleagues and, and I know leaders who are always talking about, let's go take a walking meeting or, you know, those sorts of things. So I do know people like that, but for the most part, the kind of the norm, the tradition is sit at the table for the in-person meeting or sit at your desk for the zoom meeting don't fidget too much pay attention and like all these markers of like are you paying attention are you engaged um it's 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 really this subset of like what works for some people but not for other people and and it's really unfortunate because it it really ends up um short-circuiting uh people's ability to to pay attention and whatnot but it also then has those negative health impacts on individuals. And so getting past that, maybe challenging our assumptions a little bit in the norms of what we're used to, and, you know, really ask yourself the question, why, why, you know, we, this is how we always did it before. Why are we still doing that? We've always had a meeting that and this meeting was always an hour and a half, or this meeting was always an hour, but why, like, why are we actually doing that? Do we actually need to be together for this whole meeting? And if not, like, be, it's okay to cancel meetings or it's okay to have an hour meeting that only goes for 20 minutes and then you give people 40 minutes of their life back. <laughs> or if it really is going to be long, it's okay to say after 30 minutes, okay, let's everyone stand up, you know, let's move around a little bit. We'll, we're going to continue, um, you know, but whatever, like we get, let's get some movement or, you know, take a bio break, let people um, get out of the room for five minutes or whatever. Like all those things are perfectly fine and it can reinvigorate people. The only time that pre pandemic, the only time that I really consistently saw people, you know, demonstrate or, or, you know, it seemed like people felt like it was okay to stand up and move around in a meeting is if I was traveling 
like say I, I went to Asia and and there was jet lag uh, and a big time difference, you know, and like someone's like nodding off in a meeting, they're trying to even just stay awake, then standing up like that seemed acceptable. But that seems silly that it has to get to that extreme before you feel like it's okay for somebody to actually get up and move around. <laughs> I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue. What some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. That's the part where I, I kind of reference back to how are people learning and if it's easier for people to learn while they fidget or maybe while they bounce a ball. This is actually something that's beautiful now that with remote work is you can mute yourself and then you're not actually distracting people as much. You can go off camera and you can do the movements. You can stand up, do some stretches or whatever that you like to do, and you can still listen and pay attention. And I think that's where sometimes leaders, they think, well, this is how I learn. So obviously that's how others need to learn as well. And then the other sometimes fault or mistake is thinking as a leader, of course, I need to be present at every single meeting. If you're just there to observe, do you really need to be present at that meeting? If you're, if throughout the whole meeting, you, all you did was nod your head and maybe just say yes a couple of times, I question of maybe you need to put it into your employee's hands. And that's what builds that culture of trust where you know that they're going to do the job. And then you know that cameras off or on, they're going to be able to do the things that they should be doing. Um, but I, yeah, I and, and with you'll, you, yeah. you'll even be short circuiting your team when you're sitting in meetings uh, that you don't need to be in because people will, whether it's your intention or not, if you're there and you have subordinates, other members of your team try, who are actually doing the work, they're trying to make the decisions, they're trying to do everything and you're in the room, naturally, what are they going to do? They're going to turn to you. They're going to run things by you. They're going to look for permission rather than just move forward. Uh, right. And so even if you don't intend to do that, you, you think you're there just to support them. You know, I, I suppose it depends on the, the culture and dynamic of your individual team, but that really can short circuit a lot of teams and their ability to be innovative. So uh, just one other reason why that's a bad idea. Right. And, it, it, and then you're the bottleneck. Um, but this is also a place where I, um, so leaders do need to be the change. I, the, the last book of, of uh, the last chapter of the book is called Leaders Must Be the Change because I do believe that. But the thing that I, I think personally is that we think leaders and we use the word leaders and immediately we go, oh, C-suite executives, senior managers, really anybody could be a leader. Really, you could be the lowest employee on, in the company and you can go, okay, you know, this is what they want me to do. I'm going to accept that that's how they want me to do it. Maybe I'm going to bring in some innovation into this. Maybe I'm going to do exactly what they do and help others on my team follow the lead of my leader. That's still leading in some sense. It may be a lower level of leadership and maybe doesn't feel as impactful, but it's a way that you can definitely engage. And when that happens, all of a sudden, those bosses that aren't maybe as true leaders, but are just kind of have the title, they can see that they can step away. And that's where the culture starts shifting to the one that we really want to cultivate. And we've already referred to it a little bit, um, but let's come back and put a really fine point on this. So if I'm sitting too much, I'm, you know, I'm not um, getting up every half hour or even every hour, I'm in meeting after meeting, you know, I can get headaches 
by, you know, from sitting behind my screen, I, my back's going to hurt. Um, you know, I might have repetitive uh, motion injury from typing and, you know, with my wrists, uh, things like that. There's all these, these types of, um, negative health consequences, uh, in terms of physical health and well-being, there's also psychological challenges that can come from that uh, perpetually. With your background and you're an expert in this area, like what? Maybe you can run off the laundry list of like all the really negative impacts that this is going to have um, in the short term, medium, and long term for our people. Absolutely. And uh, the way I like to talk about this is almost like a timeline of sitting of, so you started sitting and what kind of comes in as you sit for longer, longer, longer throughout the day. So, and this is where you find out why I say 20 to 30 minutes at about 20 minutes of sitting. Effectively, we have what's called gene expression of our muscles that tell our muscles to break down this. What that really means is our body starts to kind of think about breaking down muscles. It does not break down muscles. I don't want people to be freaking out about that, but it's, it's starting that kind of idea and thinking process at 30 minutes of sitting, we're having less blood flowing to our brain, which is, that's the bigger reason of saying, okay, get up after about 20, 30 minutes, because that's really going to help you think a little bit more clearly. As we go into much, much longer, we have that forward head posture. A lot of us where our chin is sticking out towards our screen that actually decreases the amount of airflow that we're having. And so over that whole time, the longer that you sit there, you're having less oxygen that's getting to your brain. So what that pans out in the more of a long-term thing is, so say you're sitting for six or more hours a day, increased likelihood of anxiety and depression. Like the great thing is exercise can help with that because of the, the endorphins and everything that's released. We go to eight hours of sitting. Eight hours of sitting doubles our risk of cardiovascular disease, which is huge. Um, so cardiovascular disease, still number one killer with the pandemic going on. It's, it's a huge issue that we need to be worried about. And then of course, that final kind of thing of 11 or more hours of sitting, and this is throughout the day. This isn't saying you sat and never got up for 11 hours, but throughout the day shoots up the risk of, uh, premature death, we should say by 40%. That's kind of the big part. So you're having reduced blood flow, reduced airflow, and your organs, that includes your brain and the rest of your systems, can't function properly. So that's, of course, going to have an impact on your hormones. That's going to impact your mood, your productivity, your mental health. So it's this slew of the entire system is being impacted. And movement helps with that. Uh, interrupting sitting helps with that. Uh, but we have to understand that it's not as if, okay, I got up for 30 seconds. I'm going to sit back down. I did that five times a day. That's it. I'm done that reduces your sitting by what, two and a half minutes, five minutes. There's still so many hours and that we need to reduce throughout all of it. And that sounds overwhelming to me, you know, as I'm trying to think about <laughs> how to really, you know, both for me, like I, I have personal responsibility for myself and I want to, to be healthy for myself and for my family, my wife and my kids. But I also have people that report to me that I have responsibility for. And so I, I, I need to make sure that they're healthy and that their well-being is taken into account but that seems like a really tall order. Like that's like work is not designed. Most of our jobs aren't designed to keep us up and moving around that much during the day. So what, what are some, you know, ideas on how we can go about doing that as a leader to make sure that not only for ourselves, but for our teams, that we really just, everyone is much more mobile. Sure. Start small, always start small. Cause even when I said 20 to 30 minutes, that's when you're getting up, you can start at two hours. You can start at one hour. Start very small and with a team, you have to find out what are the things that they may like to do for movement. At the beginning, it's always easier to go, let's move more instead of let's sit less because move more is just more acceptable in our society and people grasp that easier. So if the move more is, hey guys, after this meeting, I want you to walk out to your mailbox and take a selfie with the mailbox. Now, maybe they have enough time to go for a full walk. Maybe not, doesn't matter. You gave them a little bit of movement. The idea has kind of started or it took them a minute to just, to just do that. Then you start getting into, okay, now how can we possibly sit a little bit less? So are there any tasks or are there any meetings or beginnings of meetings where we could maybe stand up? We could do, like you said, some people like doing the walking meetings where you're on a phone call and you're walking outside. So finding those places and then also changing up your environment is a really nice way. I like using trash cans as an example. Most of us put our trash cans under or really right next to our tables. And so we don't ever have to get up to throw something away. We just eh, throw it out, done. 
put it to where maybe not necessarily that you have to walk across the entire room unless you're very daring, but you have to stand up or you have to do some sort of movement just every time that you throw something away. All of a sudden you're putting in movement without having to do much of anything extra. And you can put it all the way across and try to do a basketball shot as, as they constantly do on, on TV or anything like that. If you miss, you get up and you go and you pick it up. So finding these little things that you can do around your office where if you're constantly going over to a bookshelf or something else that you need to pull for reference, put it a little further away. Put it to the point where you have to stand up every time you do it as opposed to swivel in the chair and scoot on over there. As you share this with your team, they're gonna have ideas of their own. And that's the beautiful part of it. As they share their tips, you kind of make this collection of, okay, what can we all do together? Because that's gonna be different for each team. It's not a cookie cutter approach and maybe standing meetings won't work for some of them. That's where you might have to have more of the standing one-on-ones for the people that really want to do that. And you can create a fitness challenge for a month saying, okay, what is the one thing you're gonna to commit to that we're gonna reduce sitting with? Just one thing, small thing. It, doesn't have to be big at all. And so you start small and you slowly progress and add and add and add. And I usually say add one little thing every one to two weeks and then slowly let it snowball. Because otherwise, like you said, you get overwhelmed. If all of a sudden I asked you to cut your sitting down by three or four hours, way too much, way too much. Excellent. Excellent. Stefan, it has been a pleasure. I note the time. I'm going to have to let you go here in just a minute. But before we close, I wanted to give you a chance to share with listeners how they can get connected with you, find out more about your work, and then give us a final word on the topic for today. Sure. So Stefan Dodd Zavalin uh, is the, the Instagram. That's where I honestly post the vast majority of, of my content to help people with videos and all these kind of hints uh, and tips ltmmtl.com is the website where you can find the book. You can also find a bunch of free longer videos that can be very educational for you. And Stefan's Avalon on LinkedIn. I'm, I'm all over all the social medias for that. Uh, my bi biggest takeaway, and we kind of touched on this. I talk about the idea of let's think instead of moving more to sit less. That can be applied to so many things in our lives. Let's maybe look at, can we do less of the bad thing instead of just trying to pile on more of the good things we're supposed to do because the burnout and overwhelm is, is rampant in our society. So just try doing a little less. I love it. I love it. Stefan, thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about what Stefan can do for you. Think more about your physical and mental health and well-being. Think about the well-being of your team. I think as long as we're cognizant of this and really considering it on a regular basis, we can make these small improvements that ultimately are going to have big impacts on on all of our health and well-being, which is what we all want. Thanks uh, everyone for joining us today. I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership ordinary everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years with increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition. The average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. 
we publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week.